you want to start world building for let's say a tabletop RPG or for a book, a game or because of sheer boredom. But where do you start? What are the first things you do? How do you get from a simple idea, an image in your head to a whole world? In this episode on world building, I will tell you some of the things that can and will help you with your world building, give you some tips on how to organize your mind and show you a few easy steps you can take right now to get you started on the wonderful journey of world building. So stick around and find out more. Hello all you funky people, Funky Monkey here, welcome to today's episode. Until now, I've taken you on a journey through history to help you with some ideas, give you some inspiration and some information to overall help you improve your world. But how do you take that information and actually set out to create your own world? Well, it's not that complicated, nor is it that simple. And it will take time to explain all of this, so don't think this is a short episode that will answer all of your questions, but think of it as an introduction to the very essence of world building, at least as I see it. I will be relying on my own experience, and mind you, I am no writer, but a handsome bastard who started really world building a few years ago and right now is close to finishing his first long time campaign and my world is either gonna go down in flames or be saved by a party of well frankly lunatics sorry mighty adventurers but before we jump in our yeah story let me tell you about what i will be doing today on today's episode, as you can clearly see, I am not actually painting anything, but I am creating something. I am making a texture palette for dry brushing. For this purpose, I am using scraps, different bits and pieces of materials that I'm no longer using, such as empty spruce, such as a failed hot glue experiment, popsicle sticks, XPS foam, uh, unused, please note, very important, unused cat litter, uh, cork and sand. Anything that can create different surfaces, different textures that could come in handy. And everything will be tied together with hot glue. The purpose of a um, texture palette is to create different surfaces, different textures that can simulate things you might find on miniatures. This comes in handy because when using a flat surface to get the paint into the bristles of a paintbrush, you can either get the paint too deep and this becomes harder to clean or you can't really always tell how much paint there is still on the paintbrush and it's easier to have surfaces that mimic what you will be painting. This allows you to see how much paint you have on the paintbrush, how the paint will come out on edges, so for edge highlighting and so on and so forth. It, quite handy to have. You can still get rid of the paint on flat surfaces, but this is easier. And don't use paper towels to get the paint off of paint brushes. You still need some moisture. Now, enjoy the process and let's go to the story. Now, because it's going to be an interesting journey, we need to get our cats in a row and get in the mood. So, for this I have some amazing, amazing coffee in my mug. Man, I love this oh, and I need this. I don't have any tea, but I do have my smiley face cup. I think this is my wife's actually, with some water. And I do have something, something for the soul. Look, it's pink. and. I do have my lovely assistants around me, but both of them are slipping their whiskers off. I'm gonna share a photo of them later on. And yeah, I don't think they're gonna make an appearance, but who knows? Now, have you ever wondered why I have three different drinks while making these videos? Well, me too. Doesn't matter. How about you? Are you comfy? Are you cozy? Do you have something tasty to drink on hand? Get you in the mood for tales? Perfect, then I think it's time 
for a story. First things first, let's get one thing straight. You are not Tolkien, you are not Roland, you are not Martin, you are not Pratchett, you are not Matt Mercer, Matt Colville, Ginny D, Brennan Lee Monaghan or any other of the amazing great writers, game masters or world builders. You are you. This does not mean you are not great or creative or talented. It doesn't mean that you can't go out there and become a legendary world builder. It doesn't mean you won't become an amazing writer or game designer or storyteller if that's what you want. It just means you need to find your own style, your own pace, come up with your own stories or at least your own interpretations of already existing stories and it actually means getting started. On the other hand, if you are wondering why you should listen to me, well, it's simple. I'm a noob who's still learning and I'm not teaching you the definitive method of writing epic stories. I'm sharing with you what I learned over the years and over many, many pages of story. And I'm also cheating a little by making use of a little history. So there's nothing for you to actually lose by listening to me. Oh, and if you're one of those wonderful people mentioned above, oh my god, how did you stumble upon me? Welcome and I hope you enjoy. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's get to the myth of it. What do you need to make your world building life easier? In my humble opinion, there are some things you actually you don't really need them, but let's say they make your life immensely easier. And I will go through them one by one and give you examples of how to use the tools I will lay out before you. First thing on my list, start with something simple but very, very important. Read a lot, anything. Read kids' books, read magazines, read comic books, read the list of ingredients on detergent bottles while you are on the toilet. Read a newspaper, read articles, read encyclopedias, read, read, read. Anything and everything. This will help you with ideas, give you inspiration, help you develop your vocabulary, but most importantly, it will give you ideas, make you wonder, make you come up with questions and some answers, make you curious. Of course, you will naturally lean towards the genre you like the most, and this is perfect. This is what will inspire your and shape your world. You can create some detective stories in your world, come up with some political intrigue, romantic stories, stories of things that went off the rails so much the ending blindsided you completely. Read, read, read. I can't stress this enough. And this brings me to the next thing on my list. Be curious. Be curious to know how things work, how the world around you works. Curious what's around the next corner. Curious about those around you. This, in my opinion, is very important because you need to be curious about your own world. The one you're building. What's around the next corner? What's in the woods over there? What does the marketplace look like? How does the barkeep speaks and why do they have that accent? You need to train your curiosity. Most of us unfortunately have lost our curiosity as we became adults. You need to retrain your pure and innocent curiosity. If you're not curious about the world around you, how will you be curious about the world you are building? What will make you enjoy it more. This goes hand in hand with the next item on my list. Know the world around you. It's not enough to only be curious about it, you need to learn about it. The weirder the details the you know, the better. Why? Because you need to populate your world and make it more believable and make it intriguing. Lean on the knowledge you gathered while doing your job, for example. Or pay attention when people who know something you don't talk around you. You have no idea how many times I was interrupted and even mocked when talking about history or archaeology by people who had no idea about the domain and apparently did not even want to find out something new, something interesting. Don't be like that. Pay attention. You might find out new, exciting things, things that could inspire you. Let's take a very simple 
example. Take for example Brandon Lee Mulligan, the awesome world builder. He's super knowledgeable about birds. Might sound weird, but I listen to the info he shares and then look up the birds he's mentioning. Why? To find out more. Some small detail that I could use that could come in handy later on. And so I stumbled upon this little fellow, the great eared Nightjar, who can be an awesome familiar for a wizard apprentice, for example. I also learned that owls make for a very, very poor messenger bird, like Hedwig in Harry Potter and so many other weird things. And also, he uses bird knowledge in his role playing to include it to somehow intimidate other characters. This is mind blowing. It would, in theory, make no sense, but it makes so much sense. When you start talking about birds of prey, for example, and you make analogies and uh, metaphors out of the knowledge you have gathered, it brings something extra to your world. Another important one is, well, and I'm gonna be a little biased, learn a little bit of history. You don't need to know all the ancient Egyptian dynasties, nor the exact time and hour of the fall of Rome. But know the general stuff. Learn about the pyramids, the Colosseum, the Great Wall of China, Greek gods, ancient temples, the seven wonders of the ancient world, the first writing press and the first clock, how ale was made in the Middle Ages and why women were the first ale brewers and why they were the inspiration for the image we now have of witches, the bubbling cauldron, the great um, uh, uh, ladle, sorry I was drawing a blank, the pointy hats, the potions, herbs, the basic things. Learn about them and include them in your world. First press and the first clock? Glass making? Gnomish inventions! The pyramids? A great ancient civilization or a very narcissistic ruler. You can make a whole campaign around stopping the construction of a pyramid that a ruler needs for some reason to ascend to godhood or on the contrary, help them build it so that they could focus magical energies to stop a cataclysm or just help them because you want to play an evil character. The Colosseum, greatest arena in the world. Make a story around it. The Great Wall, what is it keeping out or in in your world? Take for example uh, George R. R. Martin. The Great Wall in the North, it was keeping something out. The Great Wall of China, in real history, it was keeping something out, or someone out. Use that. Just use it. And these are just things off the top of my head. There are so many, so many things you can actually learn and use. Another very important aspect of world building. This is something, I'm gonna be honest, I still struggle with. Come up with names, a lot of them. Sit down and write a list of at least 20 names, no matter how strange or common they are. Just write them down. These are first names. Then write down 20 last names. You can go with how real names work. Most of them are names of professions. Cooper, Smith, Miller, Mercer, Carver, Wheeler, Taylor, Potter, Turner, etc, etc, etc. And now you can always mix and match. I'm gonna show you something. This is my list of, I'm gonna list, call it list of shame because, because I actually have a list of uh, names, location names, uh, location names, many of them, more of them, things like Ogre's Bath, Cat's Crossing, Minotaur's Waterhole, Vampire's Purse, Perch, um, uh, Talia, I don't know why. The Great Team Mountains, sure. The Trenches, okay. Sandy Shore, that's classic. I also have a list of NPCs. Again, a list of shame because I went in a different weird direction, uh, meaning I wanted to go with Besides normal classic names that you just heard, like profession names, I wanted some of them that sound elvish or 
gnomish or dwarvish, and I failed miserably. Miserably. I have Carola, sure. Madris, okay. Uh, Celestia, Gust, Sandbark, Bao, Edulak. I don't know. It doesn't matter. These, I call them of shame because first, they kind of sound weird. I did it a long time ago before I actually understood how to create NPC names or location names. And second, because I always, always, when asked about a name of a location or the name of an NPC, I always fumble, stumble, uh, don't check the list and struggle for 30 seconds quite visibly uh, to come up with a name. Don't be like me, learn from my mistakes. Okay, now uh, let's take a break, talk about what I am crafting and then we'll continue. As the name implies, you should have as many surfaces you can get on your texture palette. As you can see in one corner, I created a small debris area using XPS pieces. In the opposite corner, I created a collapsed wall using XPS bricks. I used then in another corner three natural rocks to create more rounded irregular shapes and on the opposite side I glued down a quite big piece of spruce that will help me give some more aggressive surfaces. Right now I am gluing broken popsicle sticks to create hard edges for edge highlighting and I also glued down a failed hot glue experiment that was supposed to be a firewall if you can't tell right away. The point is to have as many different irregular textures as you can get to have something to choose from. Also try to leave a bit of flat surface just to make sure you have every kind of surface you can get and you can encounter. I'll continue adding pieces and surfaces and now let's go back to our story. Another thing on my list, and this is quite closely related with the reading part, that is watch movies, watch any genre, all of them, watch series, shows, documentaries, etc. All of these could inspire you while creating your own world. Even reality shows can inspire you. Watch the, uh, I don't know, Tiger King for all I care. Watch hoarders, watch auctioneers, I don't care. This will allow you to gather more inspiration, even the bad stories, especially the bad stories, because it will get you thinking of how you could do things better or how you would improve things or just make them different. Of course, you will naturally uh, navigate towards the genre you like the most and this is perfect. This is what your world would look like and what will inspire you. Other things on my list, play games, video games, board games, play cards, play tag, play, play, play. Why? Because world building is a game. It starts out small, silly, childish even. Like in my case, but eventually if nurtured and if you play more, it will grow into something amazing, I promise you. All of these ideas led to the next important element, borrow and adapt from others without copying them. Contact with books, movies, games, information that you might think uh, is insignificant can and will lead you to the point where you can take all of this mishmash, mix and match and come up with something new, something unique, something amazing. The key again is to not copy somebody's story. Get inspired by somebody's story, get elements of somebody's story, but don't copy a story. I think I need to explain this better with some examples as well. Every story humans tell, every single one of them has the same core. And this core can be divided into three main ideas. The journey, coming of age, and the unlikely hero. 
depending on the story on and the creator, um, it can be an equal divide between the three elements, or they can lean on one more than the other, or they can exclude one or two of them. Let's take some examples. Harry Potter, a story of coming of age and becoming a hero. Even if initially that's not the idea. The journey, maturing along the journey and becoming the hero. Lord of the Rings, a story about maturing. Hobbits were naive, in their own bubble, ignorant of what was happening beyond their borders. For hobbits, one of them, a gardener, matured and were responsible for saving the world. Unlikely heroes. It wasn't the graceful elf, the hardened dwarf or the grizzled human. It was, in essence, four innocent, childlike hobbits. Again, the journey, coming of age and the unlikely heroes. And you also have an additional unlikely hero, Gollum, in the end, or Smeagol. But it was Gollum in the end. Star Wars. Luke, journey, coming of age, unlikely hero. Even Anakin has the same story. Journey, coming of age, and not the hero, he was supposed to be the hero, but the falling from grace because of arrogance. Captain America, journey, unlikely hero, maturing. Batman, journey, maturing, unlikely hero, with him being a billionaire and all that. Sam Vimes in the disc world, journey, maturing, becoming a hero. Terminator, let's take Terminator 1, Sarah Connor. Journey, maturing, becoming a hero. Aliens, Ripley. Journey, maturing, becoming a hero. Predator, uh, with Dutch. Journey, maturing, but not in the sense of coming of age, but realizing what he's up against, like Ripley in Aliens, like Sarah Connor in Terminator. They are not gaining age, they're gaining wisdom and knowledge. So Predator, journey, Maturing, becoming the hero. Step up and step up to dance, uh, teenage dance uh, movies. Journey, maturing, becoming the hero, saving the day. Space Jam. Journey, maturing more or less because again, knowledge and wisdom and becoming the hero. Michael Jordan, Twilight, the gladiator. Friends, Sid Tibitera Levis, Matthew Perry. Married with Children, Star Trek, The Jungle Book, Cinderella, Your Own Life. The journey, maturing, and becoming the hero of your story. And so on and so forth. Don't copy a story as you will be disappointed. Copy a world. Now that's different. But even then, you will add your own spin to it eventually. And here's an example. If you want to build, let's say, a TTRPG, a tabletop RPG campaign, uh, set in the Middle Earth. You can play in the Middle Earth all you want. You can be hobbits. But if you try to play the story of the Fellowship of the Ring, you will be eventually disappointed, I promise you. And here's why. People drift off from the main plot. They have their own ideas. They have the, their own things that they want to do and accomplish. They don't agree with what certain characters did and they want to explore alternatives. If you play in that same world, but have nothing to do with the fellowship, nothing to do with the already established and existing story, you are golden. You could be an advanced scouting party who actually clears the way for the fellowship to a certain degree, or be the adventurers who are sent by Elrond to uh, the Dunedain to go help Aragorn take the pass through the mountains. Why not? Perhaps the group of adventurers you are playing with fought off attacks against Rivendell while Frodo and Sam were in Mordor. Or you could be playing in the aftermath of the War of the Ring. Perhaps with Sauron banished, others try and fill the void. You are not interfering with the story at all, but carve your own path based on an already existing story and canon. Or Let's say you are playing in Harry Potter. If you have your players be Ron, Hermione and Harry, I promise you before long, they will want to set the Slytherin common room on fire and steal Draco's diary and underwear. What do you do then? That's why it is much, much better to borrow 
adapt, make it your own instead of copying stories. And if you are a writer, on the other hand, take inspiration but write your own story, please. When you're a, you're a home DM, GM, storyteller, you could even get away with copy-pasting stories if your players appreciate that. But as a writer, that's a big no-no. That's called theft. Plagiarism. Another important thing that we need to touch upon before talking about my little project over there is the need for you to quickly adapt and evolve. Let's keep the same scenario. Fellowship of the Ring. They set out, and at one point, the party decides that while in Moria, let's say everything goes according to the story up to the moment they get to Moria. But while getting to Moria, the player uh, portraying Gimli decides that it's better to try and convince the party to actually retake Moria. And they agree. Because helping the dwarves retake their greatest kingdom will give them very important allies and will allow them to, I don't know, dig a tunnel all the way to Mount Doom and cast the ring into the fire or just simply burrow down and cast the ring into lava. Thus saving the day. Awesome, that is doable. The whole party is in agreement. They all want the same thing. But I hope you noticed something. The end goal hasn't changed. The mission is to destroy the ring. But you roll with it. You roll with what the players wanted, with what they created. Went down the rabbit hole with them, but the mission stays the same. You just took a different route. If you have a goal in mind, you can take a story and roll with it. Just go like this, if in the end you reach the same you need to be able to adapt. Otherwise, your alternative is to what? Stop playing? Have the players who uh, go off the beaten path or the uh, story kicked out of the group leave the campaign entirely? What if the player playing Aragorn wants to again go and take on the Wraiths instead of following the plan? What if they actually succeed to take out the Nazgul on Weathertop. What do you do then? You need to adapt. That's why I promise you, you will be disappointed if you try and play an already played out, already created story. You can try, but you're not gonna have a good time and you're gonna give up on storytelling or world building. Now, Let's go to the project I'm working on and when we come back we'll talk about how to actually start building a world. As you can see the texture palette is almost completely done. I used for binding the litter pile, the sand and the cork a homemade adhesive spray using PVA glue, isopropyl, alcohol, a little bit of dishwasher and some water. But of course I was too impatient and I didn't allow enough time for these parts to dry and of course some of the cork got stuck on the paintbrush while trying to apply the final coat of Mod Podge and acrylic paint, as you can see right now. This, in turn, eventually created more aggressive textures that are a bonus, but yeah, just be patient and let everything uh, dry before applying the final layer. I'm applying a mixture of Mod Podge and acrylic to seal everything and make sure that nothing moves once it is dry. You can use PVA glue if that's what you have on hand. I don't have enough PVA glue, so, but I have a lot of Mod Podge, so I'm using this. Once everything is done, make sure you prime the surface with black or gray. You will get better results that way. Okay, now we've established what you need or what would help you in your world building. But how do we actually do it? Well, there is a very important step that you 
do not want to overlook, believe me. Organize. Write things down. Don't overlook this. It's very important. Write things down. Now, let's go step by step with what I did and what I recommend you to do. And it's going to be quite easy. First and foremost, don't build everything in one go. Don't even expect to have everything settled and um, created in one go. Start really, really small and slowly expand. You won't have all the answers from the get-go. And so we come back to the being curious part about your world. You need to explore it. See what's around the corner. See what's beyond the sea, beyond the river, beyond the next three settlements. The enjoyment is to see where the story takes you and believe you me, it has a life of its own and it will take you in completely unexpected and amazing directions. Okay, <laughs> let's actually start. For this exercise, let's say you are building a brand new world from scratch. It's easier and it works better with our examples. First, you need to decide what is the scope of the world. Why are you building it? Are you gonna write a book? design a video game, run a tabletop RPG campaign for friends. This is your first step. This dictates most of the things, if not all of the things that are to follow. Don't overstep this. This is where you start. Why are you building it? Are you bored? Sure, okay. Then you won't need to put too much effort in it to entertain yourself. But if you're building it for a book, you're gonna need much more uh, investment in this. Second, select an age you are basing your world on. If you go too far back in history, let's say to the Stone Age, you are a little limited in the story that you can tell. Simply because the world was not boring but less full. You can still make it work, don't worry. But you need to understand the needs of the people in that age. These needs were a little more rudimentary, more immediate. Find food, find water, don't get injured or you'll die, cook food and evict the cave bear that just took up shelter in your cave. On the other hand, things are more mysterious, frightening, even mystic. People could not explain most of the simple phenomenon around them. A lot of superstition, a lot of experimentation, a lot of religions going around, rituals, you can make a really creepy world without too much effort because the very essence of living day to day was packed with threats, I'll say. You get my point. No technology, people were more brutal, more, uh, not brutal, but they had the more survival instinct oriented life. So, yeah, more brutal. If you go uh, with an ancient setting, well, you have a lot to work with. Medieval, you'll want for nothing. Renaissance, awesome. The age of light, fantastic. Modern history and the Industrial Revolution, Pah, perfect. You are moving into steampunk territory and Age of Cthulhu and things like that. Contemporary alternative timeline, fantastic. Future, you have sci-fi, you have cyberpunk stuff. Whatever you choose, you can't go wrong. Depending on the age you chose, this is where things get really interesting but get really, really hairy. This is where knowledge you've gathered comes into play and this is a callback to what we spoke of earlier. You can create a mental image of your world, of what one sees when opening their eyes in the morning. Chose something futuristic? Do you see when looking out of the window in your world? Do you see flying cars, neon lights, squalors, uh, explosions in the sky? Or do you see green? Do you see an utopia? Bright lights, bright world, everybody uh, dressed nicely, everybody wanting for nothing. What do you see? If you chose a medieval theme, do you see a castle? 
the stables in the bailey where your character or characters spent the night. An inn, perhaps? Or an ancient temple, if you chose an ancient uh, setting. It's world builder's choice, but you need to choose. Third thing, whatever the age, do you have fantasy species in your world? Elves, dwarves, dragon people, cat people, big awesome cows, orcs, etc? This is important as it opens up a lot of new avenues. Fourth thing, this is kind of small, but quite important. Are you in a kingdom? Are you part of an empire? Or perhaps some different form of government? Try to keep in tune with the age you selected. It makes the, your world more believable. And believe me, you will need some anchors in reality. Because actually, yeah, <laughs> I forgot to put this on the list. You need anchors. You need to have uh, rain work the same, gravity work the same, air work the same, uh, night, day, uh, food, hunger, hunger, thirst, injuries, because if you uh, ignore the basic laws that govern our world, it's very, very, very hard to create a plausible and a believable fantasy world because if you explain for example let's take Star Trek everything happens or almost everything happens in space on a ship they still have gravity why they need it for them to function humans need these laws to function because we are a result of these laws influencing our evolution. In fantasy worlds, you can explain the lack of gravity, for example, through magic. But in almost all cases, gravity has to work the same way. You have to have the same familiar creatures. Okay, you can describe a horse in... 15,000 different ways, but it's still a horse. It can be yellow, it can be metal, it can be... It doesn't matter, but it has to be a horse. A human has to be a human. You can include other creatures, other species of humanoids. No problem, but they have to function using the laws of the real world or some laws that make sense to you and your players. Otherwise, it's a weird, weird thing and you won't be able to enjoy it, nor will you be able to easily create. Okay, the next thing is, think of a plot hook. Something that's going on on a grand scale, something big in the background. You don't need to um, have this in mind. You don't have to have a clear picture of this immediately. But you need to start thinking and understanding that Beyond the horizon, there's something big looming. You don't know what it is yet. For example, in my world, initially I started with the idea of a undead dragon, a Draco Lich, terrorizing the world. It went out the window in the first three sessions of the game. I then went with a cataclysmic... Oh! Look who decided to stop by! Mango! <laughs> Uh, so, uh, then I decided on 15 different endings and impending dooms and catastrophes. Eventually I settled on one and that was it. It made sense in the story I and my players created. Now, another very important thing is name your world. Name it. And name your, the continent you're gonna do everything. Why? Because you need to have an anchor. For example, my world is called Eresal. I don't know why. That's the name of the world. And the name of the continent the story is taking place, most of the times, is Kadama. Why? Again, it's the name of the continent. I was inspired when I saw, at a stoplight, a car in front of mine with an interesting name. It was a Renault Kajar. And I thought, hmm, I will need to alter it, but stay in the same ballpark. Kajar, Kadama... It made sense to me. It's good enough. Now, because we are talking about creating a world for a tabletop RPG, 
it's quite easy. And with this, my friends, you have some of the most important tools to start building your own world. Now, Potato's 17th name is Pisulin Monk. I'm gonna write this one down. And with that, if you enjoyed this video and found value in it, please make sure you like, as this shows me it was actually useful. Subscribe and join this growing wonderful funky community. Don't forget to hit the bell so you are notified when the next video is out. And most importantly, because of the theme of this video, share it with your friends, your DMs, GMs, storytellers, creators, world builders, players, neighbors, family, friends, pets, everyone. Especially if they have a very vivid imagination and they uh, think of perhaps actually creating a world from scratch. Thank you so much for the privilege of your time. I truly hope you found some inspiration and learned something new today and actually start creating a world from scratch or help somebody else create a world from scratch. To be honest, I hope you will leave in the comments below some of the ideas you uh, put on paper or use to create a world or the steps you think could also help others create their own world or things that I might have missed. Anything to help others create their own worlds. And I can't wait to see you all funky people here next time on Funky Monkey MP, the place where you get your dose of miniature painting, history, world building this time, and trivia. Remember, be curious, take inspiration from the past, and never stop learning world building and creating amazing things, whatever those are. Your mind and imagination are awesome and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Until next time, have yourselves a wonderful, wonderful, funky day. Cheers.